Tell me your name and uh, a brief bio of yourself where you're. Oh, okay. So my name is Michael Geffrey. Um, I grew up in Yakima, Washington, so I'm kind of a native of Eastern Washington. And I went to school at um, Perry Tech, which is a technical school right in Yakima. One of only three schools that teaches uh, instrumentation and industrial automation, and that's what I do. I'm what they call an instrument tech, which is kind of short for instrumentation technician. And what we do is we work on automated equipment that um, essentially controls and sends a signal to like a computer or um, does some kind of function. And it's a unique skill. So most people that don't go to school usually get on-the-job training in the field because there's just not a lot of uh, schools that teach it. So fortunately, I was in Yakima, and I got to go to the school and learn instrumentation there and then a lot of on-the-job training. I uh, started working at Hanford in um, 1987, and I started, uh, when I first went to work there, I got a top secret clearance and worked at the plutonium extraction facility, which the acronym is called Pyrex. And what they were, what they did is we took the fuel rods from, uh, at that time, a 100N reactor and dissolved them and extracted the uranium and plutonium from the fuel rods. Um, <clears throat> Unfortunately, when you do that, only 3% of the volume um, of the fuel rods is usable material. Um, about 1% plutonium, 2% uranium, and therefore you have a tremendous amount of byproducts. And when the fuel rods go through the um, reactor and the atoms are split um, through um, fission, you also create a tremendous amount of other uh, radioactive nucleides, iodine, strontium, cesium, and these are kind of undesirable in the, when you're in the nuclear weapons business. So that's the byproduct and the waste that we produced for 40, 50 years is these other nucleides plus thousands of gallons of chemicals to dissolve these fuel rods because it's a heavy metal and they use nitric acid, uh, other types of caustics, to dissolve these, and um, so therefore we created millions of gallons of, of waste. So I uh, went from Purex, um, the end of the Cold War came just shortly after I started in 88, 89, and then um, the Purex facility could see their future ramping down. I was very new, low on seniority, and I got transferred to what is called the tank farms. And the tank farms is where they store all this nuclear waste. Uh, they call them farms because they're grouped together um, in little pods like orchards. And somehow they came up with this name, the tank farms, kind of a, you know, a strange analogy of what they are, but uh, that's what they are. So, And I went to the area. There's two areas in Hanford there's, uh, that have these tank farms. One is called 200 East and 200 West. Um, I went to 200 East where the majority of all the double shell tank farms are at. So there I mainly work on the double shell tanks and <clears throat> the single shell tanks are mainly in West area. So um, have some experience with the single shell. There's not as much monitoring on the single shells because you don't have that secondary space, what they call the annulus, between the first tank and the second outer shell that you monitor and look for leaks. Um, so I got to work on a lot more modern instrumentation and modern equipment, well, f modern as far as we go, because some of our stuff goes back to the 40s and 50s. And the first double shell tank was built in 68. So <clears throat> that's where I've been since, been in the same office building since 80, 88. Been there about 25 years in that building, working on the same tanks, um, doing the same old stuff for quite a few years. So that's kind of a brief history of, of how I got to where I'm at now. All right, and since 88, have you had the same employers? Has it been the same company? Oh, no. So <clears throat> 25 years, I've had six employers. Um, started out with Rockwell in 88. Westinghouse came in um, in 89. Uh, they, I, and I, don't, I think they were there for eight years. Lockheed Martin came in after that. Floor Daniels briefly had the contract for about two years. And then I went, then CH2M Hill took over the contract, and then they were there eight years, and then uh, presently now I'm at the Washington River Protection Service. 
and they've been there, the contractor, for almost four years now. So we, the people stay the same. The, chain, the paycheck title changes, as we kind of say. But uh, being the, the contracts, um, when I first started there, the contracts were organized um, not by a bid system. Um, the Department of Energy uh, went through a selection process, picked the companies to work out there and manage it, um, the facilities, and it was a cost plus program. So the, the, the government said we wanted to perform this work, and then the companies would say it would cost a certain amount of dollar and then add on their fee for, for running the business. And then in 89, 90, and it might have been as late as 92, they started a bid process where they actually put work out and allowed companies to bid on it. And then these companies would bid on that work with um, at a certain dollar value and with their, their fee on top of it. Um, and then that process started, we started rolling companies over faster because the bid would come up every four years. Uh, some contracts were extended if the government felt they were doing a good job. They actually didn't put it out for bid, but it, it, mandatory every eight years they put it out for bid. Uh, sometimes they would roll over, I think. Westinghouse rolled over, was doing a good job. They went into an eight-year contract. Um, CH Tom Hill had an eight-year contract. So um, that's kind of how the company rolls over. Being I'm a bargaining unit worker and the bargaining units uh, have a contract with the government out there, we continue continuity of service and our uh, seniority continues even though we change companies. Uh, exempt people, they aren't so fortunate. So. so can you briefly tell us what an average day would be like for you? An average day. Well, yeah, getting up, it uh, starts early. Um, I live, because I live in Yakima, I have about a 60-mile commute. So I get up about 4.30, um, get ready to go to work, leave the house around quarter after 5. Um, I van pool with 12 other people from Yakima, um, and we travel about 60 miles to work. Um, get to work around get, before 7 o'clock. Um, 7 o'clock, the work day starts. We start off with um, uh, pre-work meetings from 7 to 8 where we discuss what the work's being done for the day, uh, whether it's going to be in a radiation zone, <clears throat> over what type of uh, protective equipment we're going to wear. Um, each, each job is analyzed for safety, um, so we go over um, all the safety hazards for almost an hour each day. Because besides the radioactive concerns, we have chemical uh, chemical vapors, we have electrical hazards, uh, environmental hazards because we work, a lot of our stuff is outdoors. Um, so we go over, depending on the type of year, we go over all the different hazards and then uh, also depending on the type of year, we got to choose what kind of clothing we wear, whether it's uh, hot in summer, we have to have clothing for keeping us cool, wintertime stuff for keeping us warm and dry. So. Uh, and then usually about 8, 8.30, we will gather our equipment, our test equipment, um, which involves calibration equipment to calibrate uh, or troubleshoot work, depending on what our work scope is. Um, and then that's what we'll do till oh, roughly 3 o'clock. And then depending on what areas we went in, we're, we're, um, we will then have a time to take a shower at the end of the day to as a precautionary measure. Um, to make sure that we're very clean before we go home, uh, depending on the areas we've gone into. And then at 4 o'clock, we do the end of the day meeting from 4 to 4.30 uh, to discuss what problems we encountered. Um, and from 4 to 4.30, we just kind of review the day's work. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, what we do each day. So. so talk about what happened back in October of... 2011, you had an, an unusual <clears throat> day. Yeah, I did. It was after a long weekend, and um, one of the pieces of equipment, I'll kind of explain to you a little bit how it works. Um, this equipment is used to detect uh, leaks in the secondary, uh, between the first and the secondary um, tanks on a double shell tank. And the tanks are, all, are underground. They're all underground. They're whole, the ones uh, we work on are a million gallon tanks. They're quite large. And they're all underground for shielding purposes because the radiation doses are so high, they want them underground with about 12 feet of soil on top. 
So everything we work on is uh, kind of remotely. Uh, nothing we can work on is visible. Everything is done remotely. So this piece of equipment is mounted er above ground, and it has uh, a very thin wire which extends into the tank holding um, a ceramic plummet. Uh, it's kind of a torpedo-shaped, um, almost um, uh, a weighted type. Uh, oh, it's almost hard to explain what it is about a picture, but it's um, about three inches tall, two inches wide at the base. And it's on, suspended on a, this thin wire, and this instrument actually weighs it constantly. And through uh, load cells and different types of sensories, it constantly weighs it. When it touches something, the weight is dispersed, and it can measure up to half a gram of weight. So when it touches something that we know uh, what level that plummet is at, it actually measures the, the depth that it goes at. So my part of my job is to keep this calibrated, keep it working, and we've had this equipment in place since 95. A uh, very good piece of equipment, and we've, we constantly uh, calibrate these and check the sensitivity. And so when I came in on Monday, um, I was approached by my supervisor that, that my work scope had totally changed that day. And I was kind of in what we call ur uh, urgent mode, which meant that I didn't go to the morning meetings. I immediately went out to the field to check equipment because over the, on Sunday, this equipment had detected uh, a level change in the annulus. Normally, our annulus space should be zero, should have no levels of any liquid and it detected about a half inch of liquid. So me being an instrument tech and working with this equipment, we always trust our instruments and believe they're accurate. Sometimes the management or operation people that monitor or watch the equipment, um, because over their lifespan they've had false alarms and um, we have never detected a leak, they assume that the equipment's not working right. So immediately we always have a difference of opinion. And their opinion was that uh, <clears throat> the equipment had failed and that I needed to go out and find out why it failed. And my, my canned response, they know me very well, is uh, I, it's, uh, let's assume it's working and that we have a problem. So usually immediately there's a difference of opinion. Um, <clears throat> so um, got my equipment, my test equipment, my computer, and I took, went out to the field. It's something I can do by myself. I can take out some equipment. I don't need additional help from other instrument techs, but I do need a health physics technician. And this person is um, skilled at measuring do uh, radiation. And if we encounter radiation, what the dose rates or the human effect is uh, on people. And you require to take um, this person with you for 90% of your work in the field um, just for safety reasons. So myself and uh, one of the health physics technicians went out to the field and we went out to this piece of equipment on top of the, the tank and I put my computer to it and did some diagnostics checks and, the, and it, worked, it looked like a period it was working perfectly fine. It had no error codes, um, nothing of the typical problems you would see. So there's kind of some checks you go through to double check. So you have redundancy in your systems because you don't want to put all your baskets in one, you know, eggs all in one basket. So uh, you have a redundancy. And there's some checks. Then you can perform with this piece of equipment to check change, uh, check the different levels. I can, can send it down to the bottom, go through any liquid, and find the bottom of the tanks, and then bring it back up until it go and reset the sensitivity and have it go back up to the liquid that's detected, which I did, and it... It worked just like it's supposed to, and it showed it could go to the bottom of the tank, show the bottom, and then after putting it back into the sensitivity mode, it went right back to and detected it about a half inch you know, of liquid. So that was kind of check number two. And then just so that we, now we've, we've, I've determined that we have some form of liquid in the annular space, and we need to check to see what it is. Uh, these annular spaces are, are, 100% clean. If, the, if there's no contamination in the secondary shell, uh, it's a very clean area uh, because the tanks, primary tanks are holding the waste. So the check you can do is you can actually command the equipment to raise this plummet device 
and up to a, uh, a sight glass, like a viewing window, real small, maybe three inches across. across. It's leaded glass, so it shields, the, if there was radiation, it shields it so it's not as strong <clears throat> to, the, to the human body as it would be if you were just exposed right to it. It takes about five minutes to raise it up. It's down about 65 feet. Um, so you, you program the computer and, and you wait for it to come up. And um, you casually just kind of visit and <laughs> wait for it to come up. And normally, I've done this, oh, probably hundreds and hundreds of times in the last 25 years. And um, it, you kind of just wait knowing or thinking that there's going to be nothing there. Um, so th one of the ways that you uh, can detect um, when the plummeting is getting close to the top is the, the uh, health physics person puts their Geiger meter next to the sight glass or the leaded window. And a lot of times, you know, all the times, when it comes up, there's, it surprises you see the plummet and there's no radiation counts. Um, and it's a normal procedure that health physics go through just to protect you from um, a dose rate coming up to you or rate of contamination coming up to your level and it helps you to protect yourself from stepping back if there is some dose rate. And to our surprise, um, when it got within a couple of feet of the top of the, the tank or top of the ground, uh, the Geiger meter started to go off. And me and the HPT, um, who, who she's been with me on hundreds of these jobs, we kind of looked at each other and paused and were very surprised to hear the Geiger meter going off. Um, and then as it got closer to the top, the, the Geiger meter actually went out of range. It was not able of counting um, the radiation anymore because the contamination was so high. Um, the Geiger meters are set up to count at a very low range. They're kind of the first step of protection for mo monitoring. Um, once it, you exceed that instrument, you use a different type of instrument to start measuring what the human effect is or the, uh, what they call a dose rate and what kind of doses um, that your body is absorbing from the radiation. So when you have to change that instrument, things are usually pretty radioactive. Um, so um, protocol, she's got both pieces of equipment. 99% of the time, we never use that second piece of equipment. She started using that, started monitoring the, the dose rates. Um, and they, a high dose rate for us is anywhere over 1 MR because it's very unexpected to, to encounter that any kind of dose rate. So 1 MR, 2 MR, uh, you, you start to raise some red flags. Uh, the instrument started creeping up and we went 1, 2, all the way up to 5 MR, um, which was astronomical for a, um, a space that's supposed to be perfectly clean. And then at that point, um, we had to make a few decisions on what to do. Um, so one is we had to immediately contact um, what they call the area manager to notify him because we've now entered a, a type of um, scenario where it's unexpected and we need to let them know that we've got a, a serious situation. And the second thing is we need to lower the plummet back down so that the dose rates aren't there exposing ourselves or anybody else that comes by. So uh, we decided to lower the plummet down back into a shielded area where the dose rates weren't exposing people and we lowered it back down um, in towards the tank where <clears throat> uh, the dose rates were gone and the contaminations was not detectable and we made the notifications to the appropriate people that we had a leaking tank. Um, and in in my business, there that you, uh, to say you, that, you know, a tank is leaking, you have to be very careful. It's kind of like saying, you know, yelling bomb on an airplane or yelling fire in a movie theater. If you're going to say that we've got something leaking at, out of Hanford, you better know exactly what you're doing. And it's not something that's taken uh, lightly at all. It's very serious business. So I had a radio with me for emergency purposes. I contacted the shift manager on the radio, told him, reported him that the equipment was working fine and that we've detected uh, a leak in the annual space, approximately half inch deep, gave him the radiation doses, and they immediately came back on the radio, told us to go to a telephone. Uh, the radio channels are monitored, and um, to say that across the radio is very serious business. So 
Um, he immediately said, can you please find a landline? Let's talk on the phone and, uh, and get back to the office. So we, we wrapped up our equipment, put the NRAF uh, back into service, lowered it down to the bottom of the, of the annulus and let it continue in monitoring the, the liquid down there. And then we reported back to uh, what we call the shift office where the, the managers are at. And then a lot of discussions began after that. So that was the first half of the day. So when they ask you to go to a landline, is what was your sense on that? Is that standard? Um, is it just a security <clears throat> thing or a panic well, thing? Well, it's more of a to not set a panic thing. Um, or it's, uh, it's a way of discussing serious things that you don't want to broadcast broadcast across the the radio. The radio is monitored by um, Department of Energy Ecology has um, the same radios that they monitor the traffic. So uh, immediately the shift manager's concern is that I you know what I'm telling him is a false alarm. I mean he doesn't want to set off a panic, but I'm required to immediately tell him of any uh, conditions I have found. I think what he was surprised at was that what I, what I said that I believe we have a tank that's leaking uh, concerned him because um, I gave him, I, I think I, he was worried I gave him my opinion and instead of giving him the facts, well, the facts were indicating that we had a leak. So um, it was not more or less my opinion, but it was just what the facts showed. And he was very concerned that... Um, that this wasn't the scenario and didn't want to create a panic. So um, I went to the landline, gave him a call. He said, just come on into the office. We want to discuss this. Um, and there was a short conversation on the phone. And it's about a five-minute drive back to uh, the office building. And when I got there, there was um, not only him, but um, his manager and his manager's manager were there. So... Immediately, the, the discussion and explanations began of what I had found. And it was kind of an interesting conversation because I'd never, I really never imagined myself being in that position um, ever in my career where I had to inform somebody that we, we had um, a serious problem in the annual space between the primary and the secondary. It always been assumed that these tanks would last, uh, you know, quite a while. Um, and we had done so much calibration, so much work over the last 50 years without any problems. To find that first problem is kind of uh, hard to accept, I think. And um, they were worried that I was, I was based on you know, giving them my opinion, where I'm in my field, I don't have much of an opinion. It's, everything's based on science, numbers, facts, uh, procedures, documentation. So when all the... This, this information comes forward and, and tells you that you have a leak. You know, I'd, I just presented them with the numbers and said, by all procedures, this says we have a leak, um, which still is not a, not a good thing to happen and not something that we ever expected. So it's kind of a different feeling, to tell you the truth. So kind of strange. And you had electronic data to back up oh, definitely. what you did. Yeah, I definitely did. And the procedures we have in place are all written to direct you to find problems. Um, and we have hundreds of procedures that lead you to a, down the road to find a situation how to, and how to handle it. And 99.9% .9 of these procedures never get to that point because you, you, know, you usually find a problem um, and the alarm is, is a false alarm, um, and which is what, you know, you... You would hope that would happen because we don't want this scenario to come up. Uh, this is the first time I'd gotten that far in this procedure that said we've done all our checks and there's no other checks left and all the indications are that you have a leak in the primary tank. So I just presented the documentation, told them uh, here it is. And, um, you know, we'd, being as we'd never got that point before, I didn't know what the next step was. I, didn't, I was at the end of my procedure, end of my documentation, so um, I'm waiting for there to be the next step. And unfortunately, there wasn't the next step. They had never written a plan in place uh, to how to, what to do next if one of the single show or the double shows started to leak. There was no plan in place.
And I didn't really find this out uh, that day, but as the days progressed, um, and I kept asking questions of what we were doing, and the answers were, well, we're not doing anything yet. Um, and I kept asking why, is, and come to find out is because they had no plan. They had never really, they have never planned for the, the, shell, the tanks to leak. I think they were thinking it wasn't going to happen, and if it did, did we'll just kind of wing it. Uh, which in my business you don't do anything like that. You don't. There's, there's a protocol, a procedure for everything. So, um, not having a plan in place was a huge flaw in in our company's organization. And it not, not only started with this company, but the companies previously had never written a plan. Um, so, it was then time to come up with a plan. And unfortunately, our company chose not to do that. So. Um, and that began a year-long struggle that I went through uh, trying to implement, trying to get them to implement a plan to look at something, you know, to do more than what they were doing, which was nothing. So so on the day of, what did they tell you then after you um, gave them the info? They said, okay, basically that we'll look into this. Thanks. Thanks yeah, they, um, the shift manager um, had, had, some, had quite a few years' experience in the tank farms. His manager had previously been a shift manager also, and he had some experience also in the tank farms. And at one time, um, they had what they call water intrusion into some of the annual spaces where they had a above-ground pipe um, uh, break, and the water was able to find its way into the annual space and had set off these alarms in the past. Um, and they told me, well, this... We've known that it has rained a significant amount in the last two weeks, and we feel maybe that the rainwater had found its way into the annual space. And I said, well, that would be okay, but as far as I know, we don't have any rainwater that reads 5, 5 MR in dose rate. Uh, <laughs> I said, so we can't call it rainwater when we've gone through the checks to to verify it's not just any water or any kind of liquid down there that it's actually contaminated liquid. Um, then the manager said, well, we knew of back in the 70s that there was some minor contamination was uh, accidentally put into the annulus through a transfer system uh, because they do transfer waste from tank to tank um, to try to keep the, um, the pH levels uh, at a very neutral level. And they can do that by tr taking waste from one tank, putting it into another tank where one is maybe more caustic and the other one is very acidic, and they can kind of mix the waste up to get a neutral state. And these transfer lines go through the annual space and into the, into the primary tanks. And he said that he had heard of some slight contamination getting into that annual space back in the 70s. And um, that's what surprised me because we don't, again, we don't do anything on rumors or legacies. Um, so hearing of some story that happened in the 70s didn't, didn't cut the mustard for me. Um, and it was kind of strange because they didn't, it, it appeared that they did not want to accept the fact that we had a problem. And I'm not sure why, because, you know, we, we our generation didn't build this equipment. This equipment was built uh, in our father's generation. So we're not responsible for how it was built. We're just responsible for, for keeping track of it and monitoring it. So to say that something's failed that we had no, um, uh, no part of designing or building, it w we wouldn't be taking um, the responsibility for it. We're just showing that the equipment's failed. So to say it hadn't failed, it was a strange attitude for me to experience because there was no blame to point and there was nobody to point fingers at saying you didn't do your job. It, it just happened. It is what it is, and uh, you just got to deal with it. But... For some reason, the attitude was, well, we don't believe that this can still happen. And it's when all the indications pointing to that it was happening. So uh, that was kind of the attitude for the first day, and it kind of continued uh, after that. So uh, from that point on, was there uh, more monitoring of that particular tank? I would imagine they would go out and regularly check on it now. Um, yeah, the, the tank itself has... Um, Around this annual space, which goes all the way around the primary tank, has three of these pieces of equipment. And they're set up in zones so that um, it can monitor different areas of the tank. Because the tank's very large. It's 65 feet across or 
excuse me, 55 to 65 feet across. And so we, um, there was a lot of theory put into place when they designed these tanks. And so they, there's theory that if it did leak, the liquid could start, the leak could start at the very top of the tanks where there's, the liquid is almost like water. Um, the tanks, because of the uh, sediment that settles in these tanks, these tanks separate. Um, the solids move to the bottom, the liquid stays at the top. That the liquid would free flow around the annual space and it would be very easy to detect. Um, then they also knew that it could start leaking from the bottom where the material is almost like sludge. It's kind of a molasses state, very thick. And that it could just leak out of one area and we would need to detect um, different zones. So we have three pieces of equipment on this tank, and the other two hadn't gone into alarm. Only this one instrument had. Uh, and come to find out later, the, the reason it had is because when it started to leak, it came out just in such a thick sludge like lava that it flowed out into this just this one area uh, because it was so thick. And uh, when we put the camera, eventually put the cameras in there to look, uh, that that's the case that it happened, and it detected this very thick sludge. Um, which is 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 very bad because the the thicker sludge has more of the radioactive material um, in it, and it has lots of cesium and strontium, uh, very corrosive. The acidic level was 11, uh, so uh, it's uh, it's not good. I mean, if you're going to have a leak, you'd rather have it on the towards the top where it's a more liquid form uh, and less uh, radioactive. Having one towards the bottom is is not good because the worst of the worst materials down towards the bottom. Um, so the mo that was you know the monitoring continued throughout the year um, of the other pieces of equipment and this equipment continued to monitor um, and it it showed the elevation and leak um, and then a very peculiar thing happened about a couple weeks later uh, that that. Um, it was a very stressful situation. Um, the equipment is known to have a mechanical drift occasionally. The equipment's part mechanical, part electronic and digital. And it, sometimes it can get a mechanical drift, uh, very small numbers of thousands of an inch drift. This equipment monitors into the th tens of thousands of an inch. It's very sensitive. And it can have a mechanical drift of maybe an eighth of an inch. A sixteenth of an inch and so when we go out and we see a drift like that we perform a calibration on it and we're able to reset the instrument back to uh, a zero reading because we're starting at a zero number and trying to detect any level increases. Um, about two weeks later the management asked me to go out perform a recalibration and reset the zero on the equipment and um, I asked them you know why are we doing that when we've, we've detected the leak or detected fluid down there, why do we want it sent back to zero? We want to keep monitoring what we have. They said they felt that the instrument had drifted out of calibration and they wanted me to perform a, a zero reset. A um, lot of discussion uh, pursued from there, a lot of closed door meetings um, where I, I met with the maintenance managers, the, the uh, facility manager, and tried to educate them that this was not the best thing to do because we would be then vo um, just resuming the instrument on top of known uh, waste down there. And again, they told me that it was my opinion that it was leaking, and their opinion was that it was not leaking, and that um, the that they felt the instrument had, had drifted out of uh, calibration. So reluctantly, um, they they created a work package or work order for me to go out and re-zero the instrument. Uh, I did that under protest um, because I felt that it was not the proper thing to do. So um, went and performed that recalibration, reset the instrument back to a zero level, level basically null and voiding uh, the waste that was down there, and it made the equipment pure as though it was just sitting on the bottom of the annulus space. Um, so that was very disturbing for me because I felt as though we were, we were as a company, making a choice to just not to ignore um, what the science and what the, the instrument had detected. Um, it was not a matter of opinion. That what I was presenting was a matter of fact, and I felt as though they were trying to just 
uh, make it go away, make the situation go away. The level hadn't changed. It actually, because the fluid came out in such a sludge form, uh, like I said, it was a flow of lava. So it came out in a, a large glob. The instrument detected a half inch of it. And then it kind of settled out down to about a quarter of an inch level and, ver and held steady there because it filled up a, a, an area a space right there at that instrument. Um, but it was still, when you brought the plummet up, it was still reading very high doses of radiation. Uh, the management chose, they decided, well, let's clean that plummet off and try and get the waste off of it. What you can do, there's flush ports where we hook a pressurized water onto these, onto this instrument so we can clean the, this uh, plummet off. Uh, we performed that. Something very uh, unusual then happened after that. Um, when we did that, we flushed this off. The water that we used was warm water. It fell to the bottom of the annual spa uh, space, about 65 feet. Uh, extremely disturbed the waste down there. We have another piece of equipment that monitors the air in that annual space, and it can detect uh, airborne radioactivity. Um, as soon as we put that water in there and disturbed the waste, this instrument went into alarm. It detected airborne radioactivity in that air space down there. Um, another form of leak detection that we have, and it, it immediately went into alarm phase, uh, which indicated that we had really kind of stirred up the waste down there at the bottom of the annulus. Uh, kind of the second, well, people call it the second red flag. For me, it was about the fifth, because after all the checks I made on this other piece of equipment, this was just adding to um, each, adding to the facts that we had a problem. It was just keep adding on. I mean, we only needed two things to prove we had a problem, but we were on about the uh, fourth scenario, or fourth alarm that we had a problem. Um, again, then other people got involved, started asking more questions, just beside myself, um, asking questions of that uh, they knew the scenario was going on, they knew what manager's decisions they were making. Other people got involved with um, asking more questions. Uh, the health physics technicians who work with this other piece of equipment that monitors the air contamination uh, began to ask a lot of questions. They, they knew that that equipment would not go off unless uh, it detected airborne activity. You can pull out, in that equipment it has a piece of round paper about an inch wide which captures any radioactive particles uh, that are in that airspace. They took that out, sent it to the lab. Uh, the lab, um, our lab out there, analyzed it and found radioactive material on the um, on this filter paper is what they call it. Um, and they got strong counts of cesium, strontium, um, the radioactive material that's in this tank, and those that information went back to management. Management then uh, their their statement was that this was caused by this so-called legacy waste from the 70s. Um, again, then, it, it did, things still didn't add up. So um, we did their zero reset on the piece of equipment. We had the airborne radioactivity go off. Um, at this time, I was, I was becoming very stressed because I knew that we had a problem, and I felt as though I was going up my management chain to deal with it, but not getting any results. Uh, there was other people that got involved, started asking a lot of questions. I don't know that their frustration level was high as mine because this, for them, that was maybe the, only the first red flag that went off. And for me, it was maybe the fifth, fourth or fifth. So uh, the tension started to build not only with myself, but with other employees, with, uh, with management. And so I imagine that... Uh that was a little bit of a relief to you to have other people coming in on your your side of this. Yeah, it was. It was especially the health physics technician because that's their career is, is uh, measuring and monitoring radiation, and they're the experts on it. So to have them support me was very uh, reassuring because um, they really know and understand radiation and contamination. So when they started looking at the numbers that I had found of contamination on the plummet. They started looking at the airborne activity. Um, they, were, they were also telling management that, hey, we, you've, we've got a problem down there. And it's, it's really hard. Um, we, we, I, we keep saying there's a problem down there because you can't see into that space. Um, the only way you can see into it is to put a camera in there um, and look around uh, to see what is visually going on. So everything's done remotely. Um, and 
So we we kept talking that there's something going on down there. We need to do uh, to do some more checks. One of the engineers suggested we there's uh, what they uh, access ports into the space that you can drop in equipment. Um, they're four or five inches across, and you can unbolt them and go through some serious safety precautions and put a camera in there. Uh, very delicate work, very tedious, uh, but not impossible. Um, and one of the engineers suggested, let's put a camera in there, see what's going on. Management um, said that they didn't feel um, it was necessary or cost worthy to do that at that time because the, the amount that if it was leaking was very small. And so they said there was a scheduled video inspection. They do a video inspection on these annulus uh, tanks areas about every five to six years. Uh, they said there was a scheduled video inspection for the um, the f upcoming August time frame. So basically, about ten months away, there was a video inspection to be performed, and they said that they were going they would wait if if nothing changed, they'd wait till that time frame to do a video inspection. Um, the engineer filed a, filed a formal complaint, which is called a PER um, problem evaluation request. And he filed a complaint saying that he felt it was necessary to do this. Um, that goes through a process system and either gets accepted or rejected. And it was rejected um, as not being valid. So uh, there was not only myself that were concerns, there were concerns from other employees too. And at this point in time, it's how long after you had discovered the initial um, problem? Uh, time frame Possibly. was roughly about eight days, eight, nine days from the very first, from the very first um, sign that we had. Um, it, it may have been longer, it may have been 10 days, but it's within a less than a two week span. And this is all, all these decisions are happening within the company at this point. There's no outside. Uh, no, no entities. outside. Um, Entities were involved at this time. Um, the, the, it was um, I would it was, the decisions were being made at the middle middle management level, as far as I know. What happened behind a lot of closed doors, so and a lot of phone conversations were going on. So who was being talked to and who was making the decisions? I really don't know. Um, when this equipment goes off, um, they're required to contact the uh, Department of Ecology and DOE and notify them that the equipment's got off. What they also did, though, was they gave their opinion of why it went off. Um, and their opinion, they told them that the equipment has gone off, but we feel it's gone off in error because of intrusion or uh, leakage of rainwater into the space. Um, and so when they put that in the same statement, they didn't allow these um, entities to ask questions. They gave them the answer ahead of time. So it, it set a mindset with the Department of Ecology and DOE that, that as if our management knew exactly what was going on and that uh, they had the answer already, so don't even ask the question, and uh, which was not the right thing to do. The, the thing that they should have done just told me, we've, this equipment's gone to alarm, we've found these situations, and then allowed the Department of Ecology and DOE to ask questions. Um, they didn't even give them the opportunity they, they said, this equipment's gone off, we think it's rainwater, so don't worry about it. All right, and they gave that uh, opinion to DOE right. eight days in? Uh, the very first day. Uh, the very first day they gave that opinion. Then the uh, scenarios that happened after that, they were not required to report that information to the Department of Ecology or Department of Energy uh, because they have they have a list of requirements when equipment goes into alarm they've got to make a notice and make a um, notification to the state to the federal government um, after that they already made their one notification the other instance that came up after that they weren't required to give any more notification so they didn't they therefore um, just kept that information internal so what incidents came up after that um, well, the, the equipment continued to monitor. Um, I went on to other work, um, still in the back of my mind, knowing this problem existed. 
And, um, you know, I'm not at the luxury to pick what things I do work on. I have to go do other stuff. But knowing that that still existed out there, I still monitor the tank because this equipment all reports to a computer. Uh, in my field, in my uh, job, I'm a, I have access to this computer system, and I can go back and uh, look at it to ret retrieve data, which I did weekly, kind of keeping an eye on it because it, it really concerned me. And plus, then all of a sudden, I'm starting to question my own ability that if I knew what I was doing, uh, because I've been trying to, con some have been trying to convince me that I didn't. So I was kept thinking if there's something I did that I missed the problem, if there was something that I could have done differently to, to explain it better. So I started really questioning myself and, and my abilities, so it really bothered me, and I kept looking for different answers. And I kept looking on to find more evidence to show them that, hey, we need to keep looking at this. Um, and it moved on into the Christmas season, followed up um, into the spring. Uh, spring rolled around in March. Um, this piece of equipment that I was talking about, um, actually when it had an air code, went into a failure mode. Uh, again, it was one of those mornings where I come in and, um, and they grabbed me and said, hey Mike, we got uh, an air code on that NRAF. Uh, that's the name of the equipment we, we use. And I said, you, you do? What kind of air code? And they gave me uh, the air numbers that came across the computer. Looked them up in, the, in my book that I have because there's hundreds of uh, air codes that come across. And it told me that the, the plummet was uh, stuck to the bottom or was unable to move, which was surprising. Um, so I went out with my computer, my laptop, hooked up to the equipment, um, started doing some computer scans and some checks, and sure enough, uh, the plummet, I could not raise it or lower it or move it or do anything with it. It was stuck at about um, a little less than a quarter of an inch, it showed for a level, would not move, would not go anywhere. S totally uh, bizarre situation, never happens on this piece of equipment. Uh, we use this equipment, I'll kind of explain a little bit, we use it for this type of equipment for many different applications. Wonderful piece of equipment designed in Holland, used at the oil refineries. Uh, that's how we found it in the eight, in the mid '90s uh, to monitor million gallon tanks of, uh, of crude oil, gasoline. Uh, this equipment you can um, they can use at the oil refineries to drop down into the tanks and find uh, different layers of water sludge. Um, it's very sensitive, um, very cool, interesting, fun piece of equipment to work on. I enjoy it because it has so many different features. We also use it on the primary tank to actually measure the level of waste in the tanks. Um, then we have another one on each tank that we'll, we can go down into the tank and measure the specific gravity, tell you uh, what layers, uh, the, how the, uh, the, the waste has layered itself out and let you know that the first layer, six inches, is maybe like a water solution. The next is maybe like jello, or uh, we can act, this equipment will tell you all this information through uh, telling you how dense it is. Um, and then, so each tank has roughly five of these pieces of equipment, one to measure the waste, one to, to measure the specific gravity or the density of the material, and then three on the outside monitoring for leaks. Um, so it's a really interesting piece of equipment. And occasionally, um, one of these will stick to the, in the waste uh, because the waste in the tank is very gooey in some of the tanks. And the plummet will stick um, on the primary one it, to the waste. And, but I can go through some commands and get it undone. Um, it will kind of work its way out. We can bring it up and then we do a flush on it, clean it off to get the gooey stuff off of it. Uh, and on those, you know, depending on what tank we are, we can see different dose rates. We talked about dose rates. Uh, because they're measuring, actually in the waste, measuring the waste. Um, so to have the annulus one where it's totally a clean space, where there's nothing down there but just the steel floor, to have one get stuck was extremely unusual. Never happened before. And we've literally got, uh, if you do the math, 28 tanks times 5, uh, you know, so basically 250, 200, 300 of these NRAF pieces of equipment had never seen one uh, stuck in the annulus space before. So we generated a work, I went back to management and said, hey, we got, we got a problem. We've got uh, our plummet stuck on the bottom of the NRAF, uh, at the annulus space on the NRAF. Uh, management was extremely surprised when I told them that. And, and 
they ask me why. Well, I say, well, something's glued it to the floor, and they're probably nuclear waste. Um, and I kind of said it like that, and instantly they were defensive. Um, uh, well, Mike, let's not, you know, let's not say that kind of words. I mean, again, back to the uh, fire in the, in the movie theater thing. Um, how dare you say that? And anyhow, um, so the dialogue started. Well, let's just get past that. Let's not get stuck in that, in that circle of conversation again. Let's. How are we going to fix it? Um, I said, well, we're going to have to stick a camera in there, <clears throat> find out what is stuck and what is what's going on there. And any other options? And I didn't give them any other options. Uh, and actually, there was none, <laughs> to tell you the truth. But I, I said, well, the, <clears throat> the cameras, we've got to find out why it's stuck and how we can get it unstuck. Um, so they said, okay, well, we'll put a camera in there. There's a access port right next to it. We'll put a camera in there. Um, they chose to use a black and white camera at first, uh, kind of unusual. We have colored cameras very that are articulating. You can move around, um, do a thorough inspection. And then we have a very old black and white ones, which um, do not move. They go just have a straight on vision shot. Um, I asked them why they wanted the black and white. They said, well, the colored stuff is being used for other jobs right now. We're just going to do a quick check with the black and white one, go down there, take a look, see what's, what's going on. Um, um, I would have liked to complain, but I was just happy we're sticking a camera in there to, to be looking, black or white or not. So uh, through a lot of planning, a lot of safety precautions, about took almost a week to generate the work uh, package because um, getting all the approvals to do this, you have to go through our internal auditing system of safety um, and radiation controls. Um, uh, chemical hazard controls. Anytime we do uh, access into the annulus or primary space, we have to go through a lot of precautions. So a week later, we put the camera in, um, lowered the camera, and when they got down to the bottom, they could see the plummet, which was stuck in something, and the, the surface down there looked, um, in a black and white image, kind of looked like a shiny, slimy kind of surface down there, um, not a normal metal metallic look, uh, which you can see, you know, uh, which is difficult to tell in a black and white, but it looked very different. It had different textures to it, almost like um, the top swirls of pudding or something to that effect. Um, and there was maybe five or six of watches on the camera at the time. And we all were kind of in awe. Um, when we dropped the camera in there, we're going, we all said amongst ourselves, that doesn't look like the bottom of the annulus, because we have seen it hundreds of times through other video inspections. And we could see the plummet, and it was definitely glued to the bottom. And we, there was not a really um, a lot of dialogue of what it was. We just knew it looked strange and very different and not normal. Uh, made a lot of comments about what the texture looked like. Um, it was tough to tell because it wasn't colored, a colored photograph, but you could definitely see that there was something down there. Um, we took the video, stopped the work, took the videotape, we taped the image. I went back to the office. I then went on to other work um, and was not available for, for any questions, but then again, it wasn't my area to to give answers because it, the video is, inspection is done by engineers, look at the video, management looks at the video. Um, they didn't make a decision of what they were going to do that day. The next day we had a meeting and they, they told us what they had decided they wanted to do. And they, they said, well, we feel that there's some kind of solution down there that has obviously glued the plummet to the bottom of the annual space, but they didn't know what it was. And that they felt that they were just going to um, abandon that piece of equipment at that location and put move that type of equipment to a different space about 20 feet away from where this other one was. Um, they had to do that because the state regulations for um, monitoring of hazardous waste underground, the re state requirement says you have to have three detectors monitoring the annual space. Um, so with only having two in place, they still had to get a third one in operation. And they chose to just abandon that one there and put another one in about 20 feet away on the annual space um, and let that one go, which um, was kind of a unique decision. 
because it was more of just walking away from a problem that was there and not having to deal with it. So um, that's what we did. We actually um, were able to take this piece of equipment, cut the wire on it, um, and abandon the wire and the plummet in the, in, the, in the annual space and move it over to a different riser is what they're called. Um, put a new wire, drum wire, and plummet on the new one. We have that equipment available to us, kind of rebuild that, that NRAF, put it in service in a different area, kind of just walked away from the problem area. Um, and we got that back in service, oh, roughly in July. Um, but we also did something that was kind of unique, because when we moved that equipment, and we at first uh, tried to manually grab a hold of the wire, and it's, this is done in, in a very elaborate piece of equipment um, to remove this. I mean, it, it sounds simple, but we use this thing called a glove bag, which is this contraption that mounts around it, and we use these lead line gloves to hold the equipment that's been in the tank or tank space. And we really didn't cut the wire. We wanted to try and grab it and try and pull it up. And when that happened, the wire broke. Um, but we were able enough to retrieve about 40 feet of the wire where it broke. And this wire is like piano wire. It's very, very small. We brought that 40 feet up. We wadded it up into a small ball and put it in a containment for disposal. The, re the HPTs wanted that because they wanted to check it for contamination again, um, which they did, and they found extremely high doses of contamination. Uh, they wanted that for their checks to, to have more evidence that there was a problem in there. Uh, it was their idea. They thought of it. I got, I got to give them the credit for that. They were, they were also thinking on the same line I was that they wanted to build up a case to say we have a bigger problem, uh, which they did. They were able to survey the wire and um, come up with huge doses of radiation for such a small area. Um, and it was something they then put wrote in their report because they write a, a report anytime they measure any radiation. So I got to give them kudos on that. It was very, very good thought. Um, uh, it was they were thinking on the same lines I was of trying to build up another better, a more of a case to to tell management that we have a problem and they needed to address it. Um, so that happened in basically in mid-July. Uh, we got that. That scenario took place. Um, and they gave the information to management. I, I wasn't part of those meetings at that time. Um, but again, from what I saw, uh, nothing went into place to, to do further inspections um, after that. Not until the, the, not until the August of, um, uh, of 2012. So you're trying to get attention to this. The HBTs are trying to get attention to this. So, and what happens in August that uh, changes the game? Well, in August was their, this is almost uh, 10 months later after the initial problem. This was their, um, this was their scheduled inspection that they planned in August. Um, in August came the time frame that their scheduled inspection was, was due um, to go inspect the outer shell of the annulus. Uh, it had been seven years since they had um, video inspected it, and they compared the videotapes with the previous inspection. Um, so they lowered in, they go through, um, I think it's probably five different areas, and they use the colored camera. Um, has zoom lens, very articulating. You can look 180 degrees different directions. Um, takes about three days to do this, uh, of about six hours each day uh, to thoroughly investigate. They went in, and they can see basically about 75% of the tank space. They do kind of an average area. Um, they went in, and not they didn't go in the areas that we had problems, which was kind of unusual. They kind of went in a different area. They had their designated space uh, ports they were going to go into. Fortunately, uh, one of the five places they went into, when the operators were manipulating the camera, they could see in the distance uh, some unusual material. Um, the engineers, they videotaped this information. They gave it to uh, the engineers. The engineers compared it from the f previous videotapes and said that was not there seven years earlier. Um, so they then, the engineers have the authority to, to then 
have another inspection, more inspections done through different ports. So they then um, directed the operators to go through another port uh, where the problem area was. They then um, put the video camera in there, dropped it with the colored monitors, and uh, when they lowered it down, they, f they seen uh, where the leak was at, so seen where the waste was coming out of the bottom of the tank. Um, they saw the stuck plummet that was stuck to the waste. Um, they found, oh, um, different areas where the leak had pooled up, had dried, was still wet. When they came back and brought that back to engineering, immediately became concerned um, that we had a problem, and they then requested a 100% video, which means they go in through almost every port, which is about 10 ports on this, to check every inch of this, um, the outside. When they did that, they also then found another leaking area that was kind of about um, opposite from where this one was at. That was not, in, it was between two different end rafts, and it was a material that had come out kind of the same aspect, like the lava flow. Um, this one you can, um, is if you've seen pictures of AY-102, this is the green looking sludge area that is there now. Uh, they found that in a different space. So we found two different areas that were leaking. Uh, the one right below the end, the end raft, the piece of equipment I worked on, one in between the other two, um, they found radioactive waste. Um, but I, I, I got to go back a little bit because <laughs> they found something that looked like radioactive waste. The engineers visually looked at it, said, this looks like waste, looks like we have a leak. Um, publicly, upper management still didn't come out and make a statement that we had a leak. This was in August of... Uh, 2012. Engineers uh, looked at it, looked at the color, looked at the the liquid, the sludge, and uh, gave a formal report to management that said this appears to be waste from the tank, that we have a leaking at the bottom of the tank, which has gone into the annual space, and uh, we've got a, you know, a problem. Management then said, well, we want to look, take samples of this material, and verify it came from this tank, which is a very, now this gets back into maybe a small part of my opinion, <laughs> which uh, it, it, it was uh, more of a political way of saying, let's not jump to the gun, and a, and a one in a trillion chance this came from somewhere else, which is not possible. But... That's the information they gave out to the public in August. So, uh, so what they did then is they lowered down some robotic equipment to take a sample of this stuff remotely. Um, they were able to take a remote sample of this of the stuff um, and brought it up for analysis. Um, and through the analysis process, they were definitely able to determine it was 100%, came from this tank, it was nuclear waste, and... Um, in November 2012, they then gave the official report to the public um, that th it the tank was leaking. Um, it took them from August to November to actually make a public statement that the, the tank was actually leaking into the secondary containment. And did you get to look at that report? Um, uh, the re I did. Um, was it accurate? Well, uh, I kind of back up a little bit on on what happened um, it, when um, I, I'll just tell you my my feelings in August when we video saw the the leak it was a, to a great relief of myself that even though a year later uh, it took a year to get to where we're at we finally um, were able as a company to say okay we've got a problem we've got a leak. Um, the political part of not coming out till November was uh, their choice, and, and for what reasons, I have no idea. But at least um, we, we were now aware, 100% aware, aware of the problem that we had a, a leak from our first tank to the secondary, and that I felt we were going to be making progress. Um, and life for me kind of got back to normal a little bit. You know, the stress was off me that I didn't feel like the weight of the world was on me anymore to try and bring this out uh, to get attention to it. I kind of relaxed a lot and, and kind of took a big deep breath and realized, okay, it's not, this burden's not on me anymore. Uh, everybody knows about it. 
I don't have to be the sole person stand on the island w- waving for help anymore. Um, and kind of life got back to normal. Uh, they came out publicly in November. I, I didn't see the report in November. I just had read what articles came out in the paper and what uh, small information our company dispersed to us. Uh, they had a, we had a, a small meeting, very short, that they gave us uh, the official answer that the tank was leaking. And life went back to normal. Um, in January of this year, um, I was, I live, means I live in Yakima, I don't receive the Tri-Cities paper, and that's usually where most of the news is about Hanford. Uh, someone told me that there was a story about Hanford that came out on the Tri-Cities paper of, of our tank, 102AY, and it had some information on it. So at home that night, I went through and did a search looking for the article on the internet, and when I pulled up the search engine and, and did a search for 102AY, there was about four articles uh, there that I hadn't read. Uh, and I read them. And at the bottom of my search engine was a, a PDF document that said um, 102AY assessment report. It said Department of, Department of Energy. I went, oh, that's kind of interesting. So I pulled the report, and it was a 500-page report on uh, tank 102AY. Um, the history of it, and a lot of information. Um, out of curiosity, I just decided, you know, I, I started reading it, thinking this, you know, here was their declaration of, of the problems we'd had um, and all the scenarios that took place over the year before of trying to, you know, the first cases of trying to find the leak. and and um, But that's not what I read. And uh, I read all 500 pages, and I think after page after page, the... Uh, the more frustrated I got because um, this assessment report written by my company that was given to the public was not accurate. And um, a lot of the information was obscured. Uh, There was information missing. Uh, There was bad information. And um, the the thing I kept going back to is on the very front of that document, there's a big red stamp that said "Release um, release for public use. It's a stamp the government uses when they release documents out to the public. And the more I read it, it just the more frustrated I got to the fact that the information that the company I work for, they gave out to the public was very inaccurate and very wrong. And this information also goes to Congress. It goes to the congressman, presented to DOE. This report was given out to senators, um, state, local, federal representatives. Not that everybody would read all 500 pages, because after the first 50, um, becomes very technical and quite monotonous. But in the first 50 pages of the summary of what happened was a totally different scenario of what actually happened. And to read that first 50 pages, it, it was like I wasn't even there, and I and the stuff the work I had done didn't even exist, um, which be, became very very frustrating. Very frustrating. And all, all of a sudden, all those feelings that I had the year before uh, start coming back again, Come back to the fact that not only did we not do a, a very good job that first year of, of addressing the issue, then we didn't do a very good job of not uh, giving the right information out to the public. Uh, it became very frustrating. And, and I, I didn't want to be a part of that. So, so what would you do? Well, um, at first I didn't, I read it and I wasn't sure what to do. Um, um, I thought about it for several days. Um, actually bought a ream of paper and printed the report up and uh, started going through highlighting uh, and making corrections to the report. I would highlight areas that were inaccurate, take a red pen and write in um, the the correct information. Took the report to work, looked up uh, a lot of the information that was on the report uh, that was archived in our computer system, made corrections to the report, and basically went through and corrected, um, made hundreds of corrections on a 500-page document. And then I sat there and looked at it and thought, well, gee, now what do I do with all this information? I mean, I've got it all. Do I need to tell somebody? And I really didn't, I didn't talk to anybody, didn't ask for advice. I just didn't know what to do at first. And I felt like, well, I should tell uh, maybe, you know, somebody in, 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 the, uh, in um, the political world that would have read this, give it to them and give 
let them take it and run with it. So I, I wrote a letter to one of our senators uh, for our area in Yakima and wrote an email um, with attachment to this document so they could look it up on the internet. I gave them a short brief description of what I had done, told them I, I felt that the information was inaccurate and I would like to give them the accurate information. Um, and I waited probably two, three weeks for a reply and, and I didn't get one. So um, I wasn't, then after that I wasn't sure what to do. So I, I struggled again with it and I felt that maybe what I needed to do was go to the media and um, tell my story and just give them the, I was just planning on giving them the, the document that I had redlined and said, here's the information, here's the truth. If you're interested, you know, or would like to um, set the facts straight, um, it's, it was my way of getting out to the public to let them know the truth. And so I, that's what I did. I contacted uh, some of the media, gave them that corrected paperwork, and um, thinking that um, that's all I had to do. <laughs> so, and the process would take care of itself. Well, um, I did give it to, uh, to, uh, to somebody, and they looked through it, and they were just amazed at, at what information I'd found. And they found it very disturbing, disturbing themselves. And they also felt that there was a need to tell the public uh, what the truth was. I can't imagine a lot of people found this um, document on the Internet. Maybe some people did. Maybe some people in the scientific world found it and read it. You know, but I really don't know that. I mean, it's out for public um, scrutiny. It's out for the public to read. If I felt there was anybody out there that looked at that and read this or were misled, I don't know who these people are, and I would, I'd want them to know the truth. So how do you, how do you, I could have written a rebuttal on the internet, you know, but who would, who would see it? Who would know who I am? I don't have the weight of DOE or, um, the weight of uh, our company that works out there. And so my, my avenue was to think, well, um, I'll allow the media to get the message out that we, um, need to correct, um, um, some things that weren't true and, and get the truth out there. So that, that's kind of what I did. And what has been the results of that? Um, well, they've been really positive, actually. Um, it's, I got classified as a whistleblower, which, I, <laughs> I, you know, it's kind of a, a strange title to have. But uh, I, when you publicly go forth with information that um, you have that other people don't, um, that goes against the government or a government contractor, you, you get a status as a whistleblower. And um, I don't really, I don't really consider myself a whistleblower. I guess I mean because I didn't before this happened. A lot of time, there's a progression that people build up to to become a whistleblower, where they've gone through a, a, some frustration and tough times on their jobs, and they're not getting results. So they they go public with their problems. For me. Um, I wasn't um, on the job. I wasn't a disgruntled person. I wasn't really. I wasn't tr doing things at work to sh to f show my frustration. I, I verbally gave my frustration, and but then it, every day I came to work and did the best thing I could for my job. Uh, I tried to you know uh, be successful and make the company successful uh, every day. And so my attitude really as a worker really didn't change. My internal attitude was terrible. You know, I was just not a happy person internally. But externally, I came to work, did a good job, and um, really people couldn't tell that I was unhappy. Um, so I was a complete shock to my company that when I came forth with the information, they, I don't think they ever imagined that um, I would be the person to uh, come publicly and tell them that they had made some serious mistakes. So that kind of surprised them, uh, surprised a lot of my coworkers because they, they knew me as a person that was very positive and very uh, happy with my job, enjoyed what I did. And they, didn't, they weren't aware that how frustrated I was. Uh, when some, they saw some of the uh, reports on King 5 where I got very emotional and um, expressed how frustrated I was and how the toll took on me, they were absolutely um, surprised. They couldn't believe it uh, that I was actually going through um, 
that kind of internal stress. And they felt sincerely bad. Um, there was, <laughs> I had uh, friends that came to work um, the next, you know, after the first or second or story came out, uh, that their wives were mad at them, saying, gosh, how could you leave that poor man to do this by themselves and to have to struggle with that himself? And, and they told their spouses, I, I, they didn't know what was going on. They didn't know I was having this internal battle of trying to do the right thing. Um, so being as that's, you know, just the type of person that I am, I think it, the, my management took them way off guard. They weren't expecting it. Um, um, the co my coworkers were, were extremely supportive. Um, I hadn't told anybody about what was going on. The day of the story, first story came out, I, I started spreading the word, hey, um, you, you need to see this report. It's about our work and about what we do. I didn't tell them it was about me or about I had anything to do with it. Um, immediately the next day, I, I had coworkers um, coming up to me, thanking me for, for what I did. Um, they, I got a tremendous amount of support from um, not only coworkers, but from engineering and scientists and managers. Um, not because of what I personally did, but I think they felt as though um, I was representing all of them too. Because each, each person out there has their own frustrations with working out there. And they just seen that I was a kind of a spokesperson for all of them, um, that they may have had a very small amount of frustration with the company, and some people maybe had a, a tremendous amount, and they felt as though I was a spokesperson for um, getting the information out and, and representing them also, that, that not only did I have struggles, but they have struggles with their jobs, and that sometimes they run into um, people making decisions that maybe aren't doing the best for the company or best for the environment or best for them. So that's, I kind of felt that way. I was like a voice for everybody. So that made me feel pretty good. And, and then they, they all told me that I wasn't alone, you know, that they supported me and they would help me out if I, you know, if something came up. Um, my immediate manager um, took me in his office, said there, there's anything he could do for me, uh, that he would. And he was very supportive. So it was it, it was much better than what I expected. I was pretty nervous after the first story came out. Um, so after that was just a huge relief, um, knowing that I had that support in infrastructure around me. So kind of kind of neat. I mean, made me you know feel good as a person, um, knowing that um, I wasn't alone in what I was doing. So so. Some of your frustration came from the fact that you felt I, you felt isolated on this, correct? <clears throat> yeah, the, I um, f kind of felt like I was, um, I, I tell people like an island by myself, you know, trying to survive. And I think that's more of an emotional kind of thing, you know, um, because I didn't, I didn't uh, discuss my problems with anybody. Um, I didn't go home and talk about it with my wife or my family, and I didn't talk about it with coworkers. Um, and I'm not sure why, but it, I've, I was afraid, I think, to publicly display my um, frustrations with the company at work. Um, and then when I, by the time I got home, I was just exhausted from thinking about it and dealing with it. So I didn't want to deal with it when I got home. So my wife didn't hear anything about it. The first time she heard uh, that I, about what I was going through um, was when we went and did the interviews and she was there uh, watching the interviews. We did about five hours of taped interviews and it was the first time she heard anything that, that at what I'd gone through. And then she saw how you know emotional I got because of the stress it took on me and she was surprised. And then she kind of thought back, um, well, no wonder you were kind of grouchy there for a while. There's a, there was a couple months span that I was pretty miserable, not very talkative and um, and she kind of put the pieces together and started to realize that, that that's what I was going through. She wished I had talked to her about it, but it's hard. What we do out there is so unique and isolated. Um, my, my family's never been to where I work. Um, friends have no idea where I work. You can't, you know, up till recently you couldn't take pictures out there, so they didn't even know what I did. So it, I'd have had to explain 25 years of my career to explain how I felt, and which is not easy to do. So I just kept it internally. I just didn't talk to anybody about it. At work, I went through my normal job. I'm very busy at work. I'm um, what they call uh, a lead worker. 
Um, so not only do I do my job, I do uh, reviews of work. I'm part of planning committees to put new equipment in. Um, I review review all the documents that the instrument techs do in my in my group to make sure it's accurate before we send it for uh, to be archived or send it to the state. So I'm really busy at work, and I don't have a lot of time to s talk to people about my feelings or frustrations. And and you're kind of I'm in the position I'm in. I'm also kind of a leader of the group, so the leader of the group doesn't usually talk to uh, his fellow workers about his problems because I'm usually trying to deal with other people's problems. So I was, I felt kind of isolated and um, just kind of internally kept it in for, for quite a while, kept my frustrations in. Try to be positive because there's a lot of negative, you can have a lot of negative attitude in your work environment. So I always believe that your workforce is going to, uh, their personality will take on your personality. So therefore, if I was the disgruntled and happy person, then my work crew would be disgruntled and happy, we'd not get anything done. So I always stayed positive, upbeat, put on a happy face. Um, when I came, you know, when I was in the meetings behind closed door with management, arguing and complaining, as soon as I stepped outside, I had a smile on my face. My coworkers didn't know what was going on uh, because I didn't want them to feel the frustration I had and I didn't want their performance at work to be affected by it. I felt like I could juggle um, my work and my um, dealings with management. And I, I, think I, did a, I think I did a very good job. Um, there was times when I recognized I wasn't up to my A game and I was able to put other instrument techs on work that they could do uh, where I didn't have to worry about making a mistake. So I had that luxury. That was nice. Because um, there were some days I just, my mind was not, on task, and I would make sure that I put somebody uh, on it that was 100% uh, focused because we don't have room for error in our business. So um, I was able to juggle around, you know, kind of keep things flowing, keep my emotions out of it, and keep the progress of work going. So, but in the morning meetings or uh, perhaps other meetings, there's there's no uh, general overview of, let's say, status on the different tanks where the info that you mm -hmm. and the HPTs were concerned about wouldn't be like coming up on, a, on an inventory and, you know, uh, as you go over the yeah. different tanks. So talk about the problem tanks this week, you know, what's what's the status on those? I would think that would be a normal part of daily life. It, 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 it is, um, just like you described, totally like you described. Um, and... In October 2011, when when uh, we, I first found the problem, there was a small amount of dialogue going on in the morning and afternoon meetings about you know what's what's the status with the tank. But it's again going back to the shout and bomb in the airplane thing. You have people are very careful about how they word things, uh, so people's questions were very selective. HPTs were were, were very. Um, focused on their questions, you know, they would ask manager. We haven't, you know, they would say, well, we haven't explained why there's contamination in the annual space. Uh, we still need to address that. And they were very polite and very politically correct. Um, other instrument techs said, you know, uh, we've also know how this equipment works that Mike works on, and we kind of support him that it, it's indicating that we have a problem down there. And everybody is very careful not to say leak, not to say the word leak, leaker or tank leaking, they, they skirted around that because you publicly don't want to say that. Um, and it, so the questions the, at the beginning were asked, answers were given, but they weren't very good answers. So people just kind of quit asking the question because they knew the answers they were giving were not uh, very accurate or very sincere. So the, the public conversations were kind of zeroed out. Now, the conversations that happened in the locker room or out in the field were very adamant, very, um, people continue to talk about the whole year, that whole year they, amongst the workers without management around, were asking a lot of questions, talking amongst themselves, asking each other the history of that tank. Um, people would talk to uh, the older gentleman that had been, worked in that tank back in the 70s and 80s. We still have a, a lot of workforce that are out there that worked in those tanks then. You found people in uh, offices that there was no management around that were talking about it. And so the conversation was very highly animated outside the public arena, uh, but in front of the management it was very quiet and subdued. 
uh, kind of interesting. You know, locker room talk is amazing um, because at the end of the day, when we, we come out of the farms and we we're, we take a shower as a precautionary measure, um, there's usually 10, 20 people in the locker rooms, and uh, it's kind of the conversations are there's no management, it's all bargaining unit people, uh, and they're very direct and to the point. And the things I heard in there uh, were amazing. And um, I never really talked about myself because I didn't want to encourage or discourage the conversation. I wanted people a lot to, to, to talk about what they wanted. But health physic people talked about the contamination levels. Instrument techs talked about the equipment and how it monitored the leak and that that was not normal. How could they not recognize that? So the, those dialogues were going on, but not out publicly. But did you not find any emotional support in listening to others at least having concerns about that? Uh, I did, you know, and other people, uh, that was uh, encouraging to hear that other people were recognizing the problem. Other instrument techs were, were validating the calibrations I did that were done right, and they were frustrated that management wasn't doing more. So that um, helped me out to, to uh, validate that what I was doing was right, and that I was still a good instrument tech, and that I was still doing a good job. Uh, that helped a lot, um, knowing that I, I, you know, I was still doing the, I did the right things, I went through the right protocol. Um, that helped a lot, yeah. Still, the lack of of cooperation from management was what was where my frustration was at. But I got a lot of encouraging, you know, words from other people that said, "Hey, Mike, you, you know, you're doing the, you did the right thing. You, the calibrations you did were good." Um, they didn't know the conversations I had behind closed doors, um, and I never really publicly in the morning or afternoon meetings made any comments uh, because I'd already made all the comments I needed to to manage behind closed doors, and um, I didn't feel it was necessary to air our dirty laundry in front of everybody. So I kept all my those frustrations uh, private with management. So where are things with what's going on at the tank farms uh, today, and if you were put in charge of either changing the culture or, or uh, revamping the system out there, what changes would you make? Um, I, since uh, the first stories came out uh, on, the, on TV, um, the workers in my group, Attitude has uh, been uplifted quite a bit. Um, they're um, it's kind of, uh, they're kind of feeding off the energy. So their spirits, you know, are really good. Um, they feel like now they have a little bit more power to, uh, freely give up information. And they, they feel like people are now going to listen a little bit better. Um, and they felt that way, I think, because, uh, they all of a sudden realized that our group was going to be under the microscope after those stories came out. So it gave them the sense of energy that people are going to now listen. And it actually, that's what happened. Um, they, I think they were hoping that and assuming that, and I would be so disappointed if it didn't, and I would have been really discouraged, but uh, we did get a lot of attention. Um, the the upper, upper management started coming around, started talking to people, um, and people's comments were taken very serious. Um, they were taken serious before, but people tend to pay attention more, listen more. The afternoon and morning meetings became more, uh, a lot more conversation became, a lot more free conversation. They weren't afraid to say, uh, what are we doing with our leaking tank? How are we handling our, our leaking tank? And once the cat was out of the bag, they felt this great sense of relief. Um, and then they, they felt as though um, they could freely talk about uh, things. So that culture has started to change. Um, even the, even the, some of the people in management have seen, at first they were, I think, a little concerned if they were going to be part of the stories that came out and if uh, their names were going to be mentioned. And the ones that were, I think, were fairly uh, pretty upset to begin with. But I think they did a self-reality check for most of them and realized that they had improvements they could make. And uh, the other managers, I've seen a little bit quicker step in them recently, um, more actively to engage in people's ideas, um, to take in consideration people's experiences more. So the, our work atmosphere has actually improved. Um, I wouldn't say it's 
it improved a, you know a hundredfold but I would say 20 30 percent improvement from what it was um, which is a good thing um, upper management I don't I don't deal with them a lot but from what I, little I've had to they're still in the denial mode and still in the defensive mode um, and maybe that's because the positions they're in uh, but the middle management seems to be um, working a little bit faster a little bit harder um, which is a good thing so there has been positive things that have come out of it and, and then your second question was what would you change so that uh, the, this situation would not occur again I think um, I, the the one thing I would change definitely would be uh, transparency open um, a freedom of information to everybody and anybody that wanted it um, and that means uh, what we do out there should be just as plain as uh, black and white on a piece of paper. Um, we don't do anything that's secret out there anymore. We quit making plutonium. We're out of the Cold War. We, we ended that in the 80s. And we're, we're now in a cleanup process where we're spending taxpayers' money, and we should be freely open how we spend that money right down to the pencils we buy and the pens we buy and how we do work. Um, uh, Department of Energy needs to be write reports that are easy to understand, easy to uh, for people to read, easy to access. Um, it, it, everything we should be out there should be 100 transparent. It should be like we're in a fishbowl and anybody could walk up at any time and watch what we're doing. Um, that's what I would change. I would not allow. I would allow press out there. I would allow anybody that wants to come out there to go on a guided tour and ask them where they want to go. What would you like to see? And, and take them to areas that are safe that they can watch from a distance and and not be in harm's way. They do a tour out there uh, at Hanford. They you can sign up in the springtime to go on a tour. They take give you a bus tour and you go around the bus and they take you to what they want you to see. Uh, they take you around to places they want to show you. They want to show you the pretty stuff, the neat stuff. Um, but it's for me, it it would be know what I know would be disappointing to give that tour because it wouldn't be giving a fair representation of what's out there. Um, I would uh, allow free access to any information that involves Hanford. I'd make it easy for people to find. I'd make uh, on the internet publicly. If I was running the Department of Energy, I would have open forum meetings, let people ask questions, have people there that could answer their questions, not just me. Um, because I don't know all the stuff out there. there. There's People may have questions to HPTs about contamination or to the environmental people about the chemicals. Um, I would just make it so open and easy for people to get involved uh, that, that there would be no secrets whatsoever. That would be the first thing I would do. Um, and I don't think that's that difficult to do, to be honest with you, not with today's technology. You can, unfortunately, you can go, uh, I don't know if it's, it's not unfortunate, but you can go on to the Department of Energy's website and look up information, and there's a lot of information there. Unfortunately, it's so difficult to do. When you get their website, it's not user-friendly. You can go in and try to understand how they spend their money. You can go through thousands of pages of, of just junk to try to figure out how they spent a dollar. It is terrible. It's not, you know, I work out there, and I've gone through some of the stuff, it's impossible to decipher. Um, ridiculous. I don't know if they do that on purpose or it's just because they're ignorant, but it's t absolutely terrible. Um, so I I'd change that right off, right from the get go. I think that the more we are open and the more we are honest, the more people will get involved. And that's what we want people involved, people to watch us see what we're doing. And uh, that's really, for me, that's really, be really important. All right. Well, with that, we are unfortunately out of time. I want to thank okay. you very much for talking oh, to us Oh, you're today. welcome, Mike. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Yeah, I'm a kind of a history buff by nature, so um, there's a tremendous amount of history out there at Hanford, and good and bad. So um, I always try to, even myself, try to learn more about what's going on out there. It's an interesting place. It's amazing. Um, scary, um, exciting, all those feelings I've had over the last 25 years. So, But thank you for asking the questions and spending the time with me. I appreciate it.